In late November 2022, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida instructed its defense and finance ministers that the military spending is to grow. Until now, for decades, Japan's military spending was set at around 1% of its GDP, or something like $47 billion in the recent exchange rate. But Japan now wants that to grow each year until 2027, when spending is to hit the final goal of 2% of the GDP. When that goal is met, Japan will likely be spending over 90 billion US dollars in the basic defense budget. How will that change the calculus for the Pacific War Theater? And what will Japan spend all that money on? Watch the video to find out. Japan's military is a curious beast with many domestic systems. For example, since 2012 they've introduced a completely new tank, the Type 10, which courtesy of this video's sponsor War Thunder, you can try out yourself in their game. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle-based combat game ever made. There are over 2000 various tanks, combat vehicles, ships, planes and helicopters modeled in the game. Those range from 1920 systems to cutting-edge present-day weapons. Every vehicle is modeled down to individual components. I love the fact I can aim at less armored parts of the vehicles. The damage x-ray view allows me to see where exactly I was hit and what was damaged. You can play War Thunder on PC, Xbox X and S, PlayStation 5 or previous generation consoles. Just use my link below the video. You'll get a large free bonus pack registering that way. That includes premium vehicles, premium account boosters and more. So try out War Thunder and let the battles begin. Onward with our video now. Let's put some things in context first. Mathematically speaking, the average country spends 2.2% of their GDP on military. How strong is Japan's military today with that 1% of GDP spending up until now? Until now, Japan maintained a military that was primarily tasked with two roles, denying its own land to other nations and denying the waters around it to China and Russia. Given the island nature of Japan, it's understandable that a fairly large chunk of its budget was supporting their navy and the air force. While on average bigger and stronger than many nations, Japan is still surrounded by nations with larger militaries. For example, North Korea has 1.1 million personnel. Almost all of them serve in the army. South Korea, facing such might on its northern border, also has a large military, helped by its conscription system. It is over half a million souls strong. But even South Korea spends a bit less on its navy and the air force than Japan. Of course, two true behemoth neighbors are China and the US, which both not only spend more in total, but their air forces and navies are evidently as important as the other branches. The US has its National Guard added to the tally, as it has been using it liberally around the world as well, almost like the regular military. Now, all those countries spend different amounts on their militaries. That topic is too complex for just one video, but for example, we did have a detailed video on US and Chinese budgetary differences, so feel free to check that one out. Suffice to say, with most media reporting budgets under the common denominator of the US dollar, one can't just accept that a billion dollars is going to pay salaries for the same number of people in all the countries, nor that the same amount of equipment could be purchased. Furthermore, some countries like the two Koreas and China rely on conscripts, which are paid far less than what a professional soldier costs. Japan has no such arrangement, with its military being composed of purely professional soldiers. Even the US has its National Guard, which is active less than its regular army and costs less per soldier. Japan has no such or similar military formation. It does have a military reserve, like many countries, but even their numbers are proportionally smaller than those of other countries. Will Japan use that added money to increase the number of its troops? Likely to some degree, but how will it achieve that is murky. Currently its personnel target is to maintain 247,000 troops annually. However, it's not easy actually hiring that many people. Current actual number of hired troops is some 230,000. To get enough troops, if Japan sticks with only professional troops, three options are on the table. Offer a greater salary, that's definitely going to happen with the added money. Option two would be prolonging contracts for the existing soldiers, that also requires more money and is within reason, given the new budgetary realities. 
Third option is to have a larger pool of people to choose from. That, however, is not assured. People will consider military service if they feel a nationalistic urge, which is not something that's really going on, though it may change over time. For example, if China attacks Taiwan, then Japan might get involved in skirmishes or simply feel threatened. So more people in Japan might consider serving in the military, even for a lower salary. The second issue is one of demographics and it might trump most of nationalistic upswings in numbers short of Japan actually going to war. Birth rates in Japan have started to plummet. In the last 25 years, the recruitment pool has shrunk by almost 50%. The recruitment pool age limits have recently been raised from 26 to 32 years of age. But that's not going to raise the number of people proportionally because most of those older people will have already picked different careers. The number of people being born each year is dropping, so by 2027 or so, the recruitment pool would have been too small without the age extension. Japan is trying to increase its reservists pool as well, changing the age limits for reservists drastically, from 36 years old to 54 years old. But all that is not likely going to result in a vastly bigger military. In fact, no one in Japan's government has yet mentioned anything about increased personnel numbers. While fulfilling all the positions seems a given, and while even some small nominal increases are possible getting Japan over the quarter million personnel mark, it doesn't seem as if Japan will be going down the route of Poland, for example. Japan may not ever get to 300,000 troops in peacetime, even with that double spending. Part of the reason is the nature of Japan's military today. While it has a fairly high-tech air force, for example, said air force is not really well equipped with modern strike weapons. It's mostly a force task with air interceptions. Before the 2000s, Japan basically did not want to have any guided bombs or other ground strike weapons. One type of anti-ship guided bomb notwithstanding. Since then, and especially since the last year or so, various strike weapon procurements were announced. So various guided strike weapons and bombs are being planned, and future budgets will undoubtedly jack those up to even higher levels. Perhaps the biggest purchase plan is for up to 500 Tomahawk cruise missiles from the US by 2027. That purchase alone could make it the third country in the world with the most cruise missiles, after the US and China, as long as Russia keeps using up most of the cruise missiles it produces. But even missiles that are nominally anti-ship ones can today be often used for precise ground strikes, relying on satellite navigation. Japan's Type 12 missile, in production since 2015, has such capability. The Type 17 missile is its sibling, to be used from ships. Given the size of the Japanese naval fleet, it's likely a few hundred more such missiles will be produced. The Air Force has the ASM-3 missile, which is an advanced supersonic anti-ship missile nominally, but its dual role allows pinpoint strikes on predetermined coordinates. At least a hundred if not more of those are set to be procured in the coming years. Now, it's likely most of those anti-ship missiles would indeed be used against ships, but nevertheless their dual role, even if used in just 20% of the missile firings, may add well over a hundred if not over 200 strike missiles to Japan's inventory. It's important to point out that all these missiles have already been developed and have mostly been budgeted for, so the added money is going elsewhere really. Japan plans to spend some of the added funds on beefing up its anti-ballistic missile defenses. Today it operates between 24 and 28 Patriot SAM batteries and 8 ships, all capable of using anti-ballistic missiles. Patriots have converted to MSC missiles, and the destroyers will get the newest SM-3 missile soon. Right along the budget announcement, a decision to base 11 ballistic missile defense-capable units on various southern islands came as well, like on the Okinawa island. Previously, there were four such units based there. It's obvious the US, which has its own bases on the Japanese island of Okinawa, will greatly profit from those defenses. Japanese units will equally so expose themselves to Chinese attacks more. All that will take time, as the completion is planned for 2031. The plan may involve relocation of existing Patriot units, but will also rely on Japanese domestic type 03 SAM system, gaining anti-ballistic missile defense capability. More and more type 03 systems are being added. 
Another high-profile procurement are going to be the dedicated Aegis BMD ships. Initially, Japan was going to build Aegis on shore sites, but have since decided to go with ships instead. Binkov has already analyzed the possible pair of such ships for Japan. Since then, a new graphic emerged from the Japanese Ministry of Defense, suggesting a possibly smaller ship than previously envisioned. Japan is also poised to spend potentially tens of billions as part of the future fighter jet replacement. Recently becoming part of the broader British and Italian program, those will yield very capable but also very expensive planes to serve alongside the F-35s. Some of the new spending is better described as rumors rather than officially announced plans, but we'll still mention some. Allegedly, Japan plans to get rid of its entire attack and recon helicopter fleet. That's almost 100 helicopters today. Instead, it will switch over to unmanned aircraft, to various drones both for recon, for weapons carriage and for attacks. If such a switch is done fairly quickly, it could be quite expensive, as any switch to a completely new system type on such a scale always requires a lot of resources. Given that we're talking unmanned systems of various sizes, it's possible Japan will procure not a hundred but hundreds of such drones. Binko does think such a drastic move might be ill-advised if done without rotorcraft drones and without mature enough unjammable data link technology. Similar change will allegedly happen in the Navy as well, where some of the manned maritime patrol planes and helicopters will be replaced by their unmanned counterparts. US-sourced MQ-9B Sky Guardian was mentioned in particular. The whole long-range strike capability goes beyond just procuring missiles. Whopping $36 billion is going to fund the long-range strike capability, of which $2 billion will go towards the satellite surveillance constellation, which could provide targeting data, and a billion and a half for the ground infrastructure, like missile storage facilities. Transport aircraft are to be modified so they can fire cruise missiles, probably using a pallet system similar to the US Rapid Dragon where the missiles are dropped out of the cargo doors of transport aircraft. A much more costly addition would be the alleged vertical launch cells on submarines. Not just for subsonic cruise missiles, but also future not yet existent hypersonic missiles. As Japan doesn't have submarines with VLS systems yet, that pretty much requires funding a whole new class of submarines, likely larger than the ones in service today, including the still new Taigei class. New such submarines may easily cost a billion dollars each, on top of initial development money. While the jet fighter fleet was not mentioned in the rumors, Japan is to add more tanker planes for in-flight refueling, clearly showing Japan's decision to project power not just close to its islands, but possibly even farther. But primarily, a lot of the money will go on standoff missiles of various kinds, even newer and more potent than the missiles mentioned until now. Some projects are already in development, like this 2021 image of a new supposedly anti-ship missile in testing, but in reality, missile of such shape and size can be easily useful against static ground targets, like a Tomahawk. Development of hypersonic missiles alone will cost little over $7 billion, according to the preliminary budget allocation plan. Two programs are known so far. JHCM missile and the HGV GID missile program. The former would be more akin to the Russian Sircon, while the latter is a glider similar to Chinese DF-17 hypersonic glider, for example. It's likely actual procurement of such weapons will cost many billions more. We have the example of the US Aero hypersonic missile. Its developmental first batch of missiles will cost a whopping $180 million per missile, of course, the actual mass production price tag will likely be well under 50 million per missile, but that's still a huge amount of money for a single missile. There's also the further improved Type 12 Japanese missile planned. It will in fact be almost a new missile due to its stealthy shaping and massive range, with 7 more billion US dollars spent on its development and procurement. There's the Kawasaki-produced future stealthy missile which seems to be covering a lot of the same ground as the improved Type 12. It remains to be seen if that will go through, but there seem to be plans to procure both the US JSM missiles for larger planes and the Joint Strike missiles for the F-35 fleet. Defense against hypersonics is also in the cards, 
not just through anti-missile systems, but also due to the recent January announcement that a railgun program is being worked on, allegedly to produce a working system by the end of the decade. It will be tailored to intercept enemy hypersonic missiles in their terminal flight stages. While no budget figure was given for that, it probably can't be a cheap program to develop. While it will take years for all those programs to bear fruit, and years before we really know how many missiles of what kind does Japan plan to procure, it does seem plausible Japan's military has started to transform itself. From a purely defensive force, using missiles only against incoming ships, into a missile arsenal force that may rain fire on a vast array of enemy targets, both on land and on sea, possibly increasing its missile stockpiles by more than an order of magnitude. Now whether the future governments will actually provide the long-term money for all those is another question. But another thing to consider is the fact that the 2% of GDP is not going to be achieved solely by injecting additional money into the military. It's also going to be done partially by redirecting existing non-defense expenses under the defense umbrella. For example, government-sponsored science and technology expenses, which are deemed relevant to the military, will now be included in the military budget. They were listed independently before. Some of the public infrastructure budgets will also be redirected, as well as cyber and IT technologies, as long as they have something to do with defense. Logically, Japan's Coast Guard, which already is a paramilitary organization, will from now on be funded by the defense budget. So in reality, the actual budgetary increase of just the baseline military spending may not reach an amount twice as big as before. However, there is simply not enough data out there to come to a precise figure. The whole military buildup is really just a part of the overall changing of Japan's stance. Over the last decade or so, Japan changed its laws so its military could use more offensive weapons. It changed its customs and stance on nuclear fuel-powered ships, meaning US Navy carriers, so those could be handled in Japanese ports. And Japan is now negotiating law changes that would allow the Japanese military greater access to civilian infrastructure, ports and airports. Due to the old existing mutual protection treaty, that might also lead to the US military having easier access to the same Japanese civilian infrastructure. The US and Japan are definitely preparing for a possible conflict, and the Japanese budgetary increase is just an expression of that. Due to its geographical position, close to China, Japan is by far the best US ally to be turned both into a missile defense dispenser and an offensive missile stockpile. The US deploying its own missiles into the theater in case of a war might simply take too long. Yes, the whole plan is quite pricey and may not fully pan out, but given the ever-heated geopolitical climate, this rearming of Japan is something that seems more than plausible. And that's it for this video. We're working hard on our next video, which should hopefully be Russia's expanding its military by 50%, which will explore all the Russian announcements regarding their 2023 army development plans. On a brighter note, thanks goes to Bank of Community. In a recent video on modern Japanese destroyer time traveling to Battle of Midway, you made us aware of the Zipang anime. We'll definitely put that on our watch list. Before we go, a reminder to check out War Thunder and take part in dynamic combined arms battles. The game offers PvP modes at various immersion levels for all playstyles. I personally alternate between arcade and realistic. Remember, think of viewers will get a large free bonus if they register using my link below the video. Try it out! And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.